one, uh, section 35, the introduction to, to counseling. Um, I'm Bruce Bradway. I am your instructor for this class. I do have a doctorate in psychology. This is fall of 2023. <laughs> this is where I am. I'm in Lost Nation, Iowa. You can look it up if you like. It's not one of the more uh, populous cities in the state, but uh, it is uh, where I live. It's uh, about 30 mile, 200 miles west, directly west of uh, Chicago. Uh, it's 30 miles north of uh, the Quad Cities, Bettendorf, Davenport, Moline, and Rock Island. Uh, we're about 40 miles uh, east of uh, Cedar Rapids. Uh, that's okay, you guys. Don't know anything about Iowa anyway. Okay, uh, this is my phone. That's my cell phone number. If you need to get a hold of me in an emergency, then uh, you can call this number. And probably I'll be somewhere close to the phone. I don't have it attached to my hand like most people do. Uh, but uh, I may hear it if I'm in the house. <laughs> if I'm not, I won't. Um, Office hours, I do have office hours uh, four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Monday and Tuesday, uh, my office hours are 3 to 5, and Wednesday and Thursday, it's in the morning, uh, 8 to 10. This is all mountain time, of course, uh, your area, that's what these numbers represent. Uh, my time, I'm in central, the t central time zone, so I'm an hour later than you guys are. Uh, so 3 to 5 is 4 to 6, and 8 to 10 is, is 9 to 11. This is the Zoom number. It's been my Zoom number for a couple of years now. So until they tell me I can't do that anymore, I will just keep the same Zoom address. Uh, there is a problem with it. Uh, I cannot share my screen for some reason. Uh, this is my email. If you need to get in contact me, this is probably the best way to do it. I do check my email two or three times a day, uh, so I'll probably get your message within a couple hours or so. Um, this class is completely online, which is uh, going to make it a little bit interesting, especially when we start counseling. But we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's see. There we go. Okay. The textbook we have is, is really kind of an interesting textbook. Oh, that's not that. There we go. Uh, Developing Helping Skills by Chang, Scott, and Decker. This is uh, a, a, a trio out of uh, the University of Indiana, as interesting as that is. I am from Indiana. That's not why I chose this textbook. As a matter of fact, I didn't choose the textbook. It was chosen by uh, the uh, previous uh, instructor in, uh, in counseling. This is, is really kind of an interesting checkbook, a te textbook, as I said before, uh, because it is uh, similar. I, I've taught uh, in so the social work program, not here, but at uh, another institution. Um, and this is the way they train social workers to, uh, to do counseling. So it's a good introductory um, uh, text. It's, a, it's an excellent text. Here's the schedule. Uh, most weeks we will just tackle one chapter, except for, oh, there we go. So week six, seven, and eight, we have double chapters, and that's all. Oh, six, seven, five, six, seven, and eight, we have double chapters. And next week we'll have a double chapter. So, uh, it's a thin book. It's uh, relatively small. I hope it didn't cost you very much money. Uh, so how do we pass the class? Well. There is a quiz after each uh, chapter, so uh, each quiz is with 10 points. Um, there will only be 10 questions. It's multiple choice uh, for 150 points. There's library paper, as I have with every, in every class, uh, five pages with five references uh, using the APA style, and that's worth 100 points. There are discussion questions with each with each. Uh, chapter. No, there's only discussion questions for the first 10 weeks, because after 10 weeks, we will be counseling. 
Um, I will give you 50 points for doing your fictional bi biography. So what we are going to do is uh, we're going to have counseling sessions. Each, uh, each uh, individual in the class will do 10 uh, counseling sessions with one of your cohorts with another class member. Um, you can use uh, as many as you can find who will, are willing to uh, to counsel with you. You can trade them back and forth, which is what I suggest you, that you do. Uh, so if uh, one of you counsels uh, someone, then they then they will counsel you. Uh, that's the way I, I plan for it to work. Right? Uh, the fictional biography has to do with a fictional character that you will represent uh, in your counseling session. Uh, this count, this uh, individual will have a uh, um, mental health problem of one kind or another. It really doesn't matter what it is. Uh, but there are some stipulations. And one of the stipulations is that uh, the problem that your character has cannot have anything to do with any problem that you have ever had or that you have been close to. Uh, so if you uh, have a spouse that uh, was depressed, uh, then I would, not, I would not do that. And the reason is because if you choose a problem that you have had in the past or that you have been close to, then potentially it will cause you to have a relapse. Uh, and of course, when someone very close to us has a mental health problem, we suffer with it as well. And that's one of the reasons not from the same thing, but we suffer with along with them. And it's just too close to home. And uh, I certainly don't want to cause anyone uh, any distress. So your fictional biography uh, has to have a fictional, the individual has to have a fictional name. Uh, they, uh, and they need to have a fictional problem. And this, of course, is not a problem that you've ever had or that anybody close to you has ever had. This is due, I can't remember when I wanted you to have this done. Sometime in September is when it's due, but you can get them in any time. Um, I do not count off for late work, but... Uh, since people are going to start counseling in uh, for when? sometime in November, I think, at the end of October, people will start, start counseling. That's where the 10th ten, ten week, week mark is. People will start counseling in October, and so you need to have your fictional biography in by then. Now, uh, the library paper that you are going to write will be about the problem that your character has. And the reason I want you to write a paper about a problem that your character has is because I want you to understand how it works, how that problem works. You may think that depression is just crying all the time. Well, it's not. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, most people who are depressed don't cry at all. Uh, if they can work up enough energy to cry, they probably are depressed, not clinically depressed anyway. Okay, so this is this is the kind of information that you really need. Uh, maybe you've never seen anybody who is a, a, a drug addict uh, shot up with uh, crystal meth. Well, what, how do they act? Well, the way that you can find out and the way that I expect you to find out is by writing the paper. So you really need to have your paper done before you start counseling because your character, needs, you need to understand how your character is going to react to questions. Okay, so that's it. That uh, should be about 500 points. Um, and uh, to get an A, you need at least 450 points. So, can you not write the paper? Yeah, you can not write the paper, but that's 100 points. So, right there, you're right at the bottom of a B. So, not a very good idea dumping those points. I would do all of them if I possibly could. Okay, so your library paper needs to be five pages of text. Uh, each page of text is uh, 23 lines long, and uh, I count lines. So five pages of 23 lines is 115 lines. So I will count everybody's paper, the number of lines in their pa paper. Um, I can tell if you've, if you've uh, tried to fudge and, and only put 19 lines in and you have five actual pages. Well, that's, 
you're six six lines short times five. That's thirty lines short. And I will figure that one out. I can count. As it turns out, I can count. What's exciting is that is I can count. <laughs> okay, so what else? What else? What else? What else do you need to know? Five references. I would prefer references from journal articles. Uh, you can use websites as long as they are uh, good websites. Uh, no, blogs are usually anecdotal, uh, so they, they tend not to be very uh, academic. Yeah, that was a nice way to say it. Okay, what else do we have to talk about? Second, uh, outline postings. So the postings are going to ask you some some questions, uh, and usually it will deal with uh, something that is uh, happening with uh, uh, with the counseling, with what we are talking about. We move farther and farther down. The fictional biography, uh, I have a form for you to fill out. It's just a, 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 a patient history form. Uh, fill it out with your, with your fictional uh, character's name and with their fictional problems. And you're going to have to come up with, are they married or not? Do they have any kids? Uh, have they ever had uh, uh, any problems? Did they have problems when they were young? Have they ever had surgery? You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, just like a normal history form, patient history form. Uh, it will be on the website. And I'll give you 50 points um, for that. Three fifty points. And then we're going to do counseling online. Uh, well, it's, is it online? You guys are, are more technologically savvy than I am. Um, you could use Skype, you can use Duo, you can use Zoom, uh, you can ju you can just call them on the on your phone if you're live, uh, but you'll have to be talking for like 45 minutes or something for a good counseling session, 30 to 45 minutes, um, you know, and, and afterwards the way that you are going to show me uh, that you have had a counseling session is by putting your counseling notes uh, on online. And uh, you'll put them underneath your patient's name. Not your patient, not your character, but the character of the person that you counsel. You'll put, put them on there. Now, normally, what would happen if this were a real, uh, if we were really counselors and we were uh, in, working in a, uh, an organization, um, we would have files for each for each client. And every time you did a counseling session, you would put your notes in with that client. And that's the way we're going to do it. We're going to put our counseling notes in there. And, and the only way that I know that you've done a counseling session is by, uh, and I'm not really going to grade the counseling notes. Uh, you know, some people like to put in a lot of stuff. Some people don't put in very much. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, I just need to know that you did it. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm going to be grading. So as long as you did it, then I will give you credit for it. I'm not going to grade say, oh, these counseling notes are terrible, I'm only going to give you seven points instead of ten points. I'm not going to do that. Okay. All right. As far as your paper is concerned, no plagiarism. And as far as your paper is concerned, do it yourself. Don't ask some Silicon Valley robot to do it. Don't use chat GPT. Um, I know some, some individuals are moving toward chat G GPT. Uh, after reading papers, I, I read over 50 of them over the summer uh, because I taught summer school, summer classes, summer semester. Um, yeah, you can pretty much tell what's chat GPT because they don't have any grammatical errors for one thing. And sometimes the references aren't any good. Uh, but the reality is, I'll just tell you, I don't like the idea of you... Uh, not being able to write yourself, and that's what that's where we're headed. We're, we're yeah. Everybody says, well, you know, this is a much better way of doing things. Well, yeah, kinda. Except, yeah, English teachers like me will go, oh, finally, you know, I can read their paper. Uh, 
I don't have to do so much correcting. I don't have to edit so much. Um, yeah, but uh, at the same time, that's not their writing. Uh, doesn't have their spirit in it. Doesn't have their soul in it. Uh, and they don't know, really know how to write. And this is what where we're headed. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> we'll get somebody to to uh, to do things for us. And I'm going to show you a video right now. And it seems to me that this is the direction that we're headed with ChatGPT. Let somebody else do the writing. I'll just tell them the topic, and, and they can give me five pages of, of text um, with references. Hey, you know, now some of the references might not be any good, but don't do it. It's cheating. So let me show you my video. I found this online. Let's see. There we go. Okay. I'll show you the video. There we go. I'm getting vaccinated with Prevnar 20. Oh, good for you. So am I, oh, because good. I'm at risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. Oh, no. I'm asking about Prevnar 20 because there's a chance pneumococcal pneumonia could put me in the hospital. Oh, okay. Have it all morning, so let's over over to the driving range and hit a few virtual balls in space. Yeah, we did that yesterday. I don't want to do that. Well, then what do you want to do? I don't know. Stop it. Wow. Oh, nobody does anything for themselves anymore. They can't even walk. If you can't fool the straws, you have to decide to be good. Hot. Over here. Look how fat everybody is. I was diagnosed with aphid. The first inkling that something was wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started with uh, today's lecture. 
that's where we're headed. Not here with this muscular fellow making it, creating himself out of concrete. That's not where we're headed. We're headed to Wally. Ah, that's ugly stuff. Okay. Importance of self-understanding. How to understand yourself. Influences on personal development. Understand the client's personal beliefs. Oh, counseling's not easy. You've got to take yourself out of your own mind and listen to what other people are saying. This will be influenced by different aspects of the client. The client's culture, you've got to understand what the culture is. How closely, closely do they adhere to the culture in which they grew up? Some people grow up in a certain area, they don't really identify with that. They identify with something else. Maybe with all of the television and videos and, and whatnot that we're, that uh, people are seeing now, maybe they identify with something else, something that isn't in their local area. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, on the Navajo Nation who are just crazy about, uh, about uh, Korean culture uh, and Japanese culture, anime, um, K-pop and J-pop, uh, as curious as all that is. So, you know, you need to understand who they are and how much they adhere to their own culture. The client's race, how strongly did they identify with their racial structure? If there are more than one race uh, represented, which is the most important to them? Is it, are there, well, you get, yeah, and you gotta figure this out. If there is more than one, is the multiracial aspect a factor? The fact that they come from two different races and they don't feel like part of either one. A counselor needs to recognize that their own culture might influence the way that they see and interpret their clients. Uh, you, you, and this is this is tough for people because everybody goes, "Well, I'm multicultural. I, I'm, I'm I'm I believe in diversity, so I I don't uh, use my culture to to, to uh, understand somebody else." But the reality is, we don't have a choice. Whatever culture you grew up in, wherever you you come from. That is the way that you put the world together. And that's through that veil is how you see other individuals. You can't change it. You don't have a choice. If I'm from rural Indiana, I have a very difficult time understanding people from the city because I didn't grow up in the city and I don't understand any of the problems that they potentially had. And I know that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not in New York City as a counselor. A counselor needs to recognize that their racial background might influence the way they see others, especially if those others are from another race. And this is something that happened in the South uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Social workers started moving down to the South uh, trying to help people. But the problem was all the social workers were white and the people that they were trying to help were black. And their way of helping them was to suggest that they act that they act more white. They didn't really understand what the problem was. They really messed things up. A counselor needs to come to grips with their own ethnicity and how that influences who they are and how they see others. We need to understand that that if we are a certain ethnicity, if we are a certain race, then that is the uh, filter that we will use to look at other people. And we need to understand that, that uh, this is very important to us, that our own race, no matter who you are and what you are, I know you're proud uh, American Indians, and I think that's wonderful that you are proud American Indians, but you have to understand that the people, the other people are proud of themselves as well, whether they are Hispanic or whether they are uh, Caucasian, uh, whether they are African American, they're proud of who they are. They don't, they aren't wannabes. They aren't wannabe American Indians. They aren't wannabe, you know, and, and you shouldn't be a wannabe anything either. You should understand who you are and recognize the fact that everybody's proud of who they are and where they come from. Self-understanding is an essential step in understanding your clients. There are multiple influences on how we see your, how you see yourself and interpret the word, world around you. 
your culture, race, and ethnicity are important. Your gender and sexual orientation are influential. Your socioeconomic status, spirituality and religion, life stage, family of origin, and disability or ability are influential. The level of stress demands in your life is important as well. The more stress you have, the more difficult it is for you to take yourself out of yourself because you are so focused on keeping that stress from destroying you. Multicultural competence is a significant predictor of satisfaction in counseling. Multicultural, which means that you accept them as their culture. Uh, one of the uh, interesting directions that we have gone uh, in the last 70, 80 years is this concept of diversity, that everybody uh, should be the same, that, that whole melting pot thing, uh, the idea that we can... Uh, that everybody can be exactly the same as everybody else. Well, equality is one thing, but um, changing uh, where people come from and, and who they are, that's impossible. There's nothing that we can do about that. Accepting people by their culture is known as multiculturalism. Accepting their culture, saying your culture is just as good as mine is. That's known as multiculturalism, and that's what we need to practice in order to be a good counselor. We need to accept people for who they are. Difficulties may arise from un unacknowledged differences in perception, and this is always a uh, possibility. I'm from the country. Uh, I grew up on a farm, uh, and because of that, my perceptions of things may be a little bit different than everybody else's. Uh, I didn't grow up in a church, so I don't have that... Um, aspect uh, that uh, might get in my way. It is critical to examine beliefs, assumptions, and biases, and everybody has beliefs, assumptions, and biases, and to accept their beliefs, assumptions, and biases, because that's what that's potentially what you're going to have to be dealing with. It is equally important to understand a culture's influence on clients and their culture will influence them. We read about other races. Okay, so how do we learn about other cultures? We read about other races, cultures, and ethnicities. We read about them. Um, and, and we don't take that as the gospel uh, because people who write books often aren't from that culture. We often read... Uh, and a good example is... Uh, is uh, um, uh, Hillerman. Hillerman wrote uh, books about uh, the Navajo Nation. Uh, well, he wasn't Navajo. Was he right? Was he incorrect? Was he a little bit off? Uh, you know, you can't take anything as the gospel. You've got to be very careful. Or is this person angry? Uh, you're reading a, a black author. I'm looking at one. Wait a second. Uh, Soul on Ice by, uh, wait a minute, where is it? Did I throw it away? Oh, no, I've lost it. Okay, Soul on Ice is, was written by an African-American author that was in jail, and he was angry. So do all African-Americans feel the same way that that author did? And the answer is probably not. So we need to be really careful about uh, accepting everything that we read as uh, the way it is absolutely. Uh, we recognize the strengths and weaknesses and of dominant and minority racial groups. And uh, we live in the United States, and the dominant group in the United States is the white population, mainly because there are so many of them. Uh, I think we're somewhere in the 60, 60 to 70 percent range now. Um, and that's that's it. And, and what is the, the majority minority in the United States now? It's Hispanics, and second, uh, the second largest, uh, most populous uh, minority group in the United States are African Americans. By developing meaningful relationships with people from various racial and cultural groups, we can gain a different perspective on all people. And this is really kind of tough. I was just talking about this last week with uh, an individual from my college, and at my college, uh, when I was there, uh, I started in 1967, 
all the fraternities were segregated, which meant that African Americans couldn't be part of, of those fraternities. So all the African Americans were independents, and they lived in the one large housing unit. Most, most of them lived in the one large housing unit on, on campus, Martindale Hall. But none of the fraternity people went to college. Well, they did go to college with them, but they didn't live with, uh, with people that were African American. And because of that, they didn't really get the same experiences that independents did because independents were able to uh, live with these individuals and dis discuss uh, uh, things that were going on in 1967, 68, 69, and 70, and 71. And there was a lot going on. Civil rights was going on. Vietnam War was going on. And a war movement was going on. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968. Uh, that was huge. Um, so, as, as an individual who was an independent, it was easier for me to understand what was going on because I was living in the same uh, area. I had an uh, African American, uh, the right next door was, uh, was an African American. And we used to have conversations all the time about what was taking place. That's the only way to get a, a really good perspective is to uh, understand these, uh, understand people that are different than you. By developing relationships with colleagues and mentors who are willing to discuss cultural and racial issues, this is something. Now, the the individuals that uh, that were living in fraternities, they were you know they're, they're these lily white fraternities primarily. There were some uh, Asians that were allowed to join. Uh, and, and Hispanics were also allowed to join their fraternities, but not African Americans. Um, they they think that they went to college with uh, these individuals, but they didn't actually understand because they weren't having these these uh, extended discussions. Maybe they never even talked to anybody. And so. Uh, one of the things that you need to do is you need to be able to talk to everybody. You need to be able to talk to uh, members of uh, another racial or uh, ethnic or cultural group to find out about them. Um, I have a uh, former student who is now a colleague uh, from ba Bangladesh. And of course, I don't know anything, hardly anything I do, but um, uh, Every time we, we talk to each other, I, I ask him questions about Bangladesh and Bangladesh culture. Uh, for one thing, what do people from Bangladesh eat? What could they possibly eat? Well, in India, um, people in India are, are uh, vegetarians. So are they vegetarians in Bangladesh? Bangladesh is Muslim, and about 70% of the people living in India are Hindu. And Hindus are all vegetarians. So, what's the difference between the the uh, the food that they eat? Well, they primarily eat rice, and they also eat curry, just like the, uh, the like people from India do. But uh, they also eat meat, so they eat a lot of chicken and beef and pork. Uh, not pork. I'm sorry, because they're Muslim, they don't eat pork at all. See, <laughs> there's something. So, you know, you, you've got to have these conversations with people to understand them and want to understand them. Not assuming that your culture is so superior to everybody else that you don't need to know about anybody else's culture. You can watch films about other races. You can participate in cultural activities or visit other countries. And this is a, uh, this is from India, Hindu, this is the Hindu Times intercollegiate something or other in 2013. Culture has a strong influence on the roles that many people see as appropriate. Proper behavior of children toward parents, uh, how do we treat our, uh, our elders, level of independence and autonomy of children, uh, patterns of communication between parents and children, family boundaries and responsibilities, expression of emotions. Now, in the Navajo Nation, the family boundaries are, are, are really kind of fascinating. Your extended family is part of your family, but uh, 
uh, when I was growing up in a you know rural Indiana culture, uh, white culture, um, the only uh, extended family was was uh, very limited uh, to grandparents. And because my grandparents died before I was born, I never knew any of my extended family. Every once in a while, aunts and uncles would come over, cousins would, we would see cousins, but they weren't part of our family. As curious as all this is, but uh, as, as far as your culture is concerned, the family boundaries are totally different. You're, you consider your cousins, your uh, uh, sister cousins and brother cousins. Cultural values can influence feelings about work. They can influence feelings about education. They can uh, influence feelings about health care. They can influence feelings about religion. How important is religion? And to some people, evangelical uh, Christians, for example, uh, religion is exceedingly important. Uh, to some individuals um, who are Catholic, they want their um, children to become nuns and priests. You know, they they are they adhere to the religion that that closely. Cultural values can influence feelings about family structure and responsibilities, as we said before. In many Asian societies, adult children are expected to provide shelter and care for their elderly parents. And maybe that's the way it is in your culture as well. In some cultures, parents and other older family members expect to be involved in decisions concerning marriage and money spent by adult children. When dealing with newly arrived immigrants, language skills may be sparse and local dialects may not be understood. The children of new immigrants may feel torn between their native culture and the new culture. And I have talked to several people who, whose parents didn't, uh, didn't speak the language. And, and so they spoke uh, the English very well, but they also spoke the language of their parents because they couldn't converse. And it's the same way on the, on the Navajo Nation. Some of you, I just talked to a student uh, that... Uh, needed to fly out with their grandmother because the grandmother didn't speak English and she needed to translate. So somebody needed to be life flighted with her grandmother so that, so that they could communicate with the medical personnel. Often people of different races or cultures have different expectations of the practitioner in the counseling process. And this is especially true of Asians. Asians want you to give them, they want you to give them a solution. They want it the first time they talk to you. That's your job. Your job is to, to fix them. They want to be fixed today. Other individuals, not so much. Other cultures, no, they'll, they're a little bit more patient. Researchers have discovered that Asian clients value insight and personal growth, but they tend to prefer expert guidance, advice, explicit instructions, structured problem-focused suggestions. And this is driving me crazy because my, my colleague from Bangladesh wants me to solve all of his problems. You know, it's an Asian country, it's a collectivist country, uh, and, and he has these mindsets. So... Uh, He's, he's giving me all these things that, I, that he wants me to do. And of course, as an American, uh, and he, of course, is coming to the United States, I expect him to do all of these things on his own because, you know, we, that's, that's the way Americans handle things. They take care of business. Uh, but he wants me to do all these things. I have to pick up his key. Hey, I'm picking him up at the airport uh, on Tuesday, and I have to pick up his key for, for his apartment before he arrives. What else did he want me to do? He wanted me to book him a room in a, in a hotel in New Jersey because he's flying into New Jersey. You know, he, I had to do all these things. He couldn't do any of this stuff for himself. When dealing with American Indians, a counselor has to gauge how traditional the individual is as to, to uh, determine proper, appropriate, and timing of eye contact, how directly to come to a point in a conversation, uh, personal space, facial expressions. These are things that we need to understand. The dominant culture in the United States and the dominant culture is the white culture, as I have said 
earlier, because of the dominance of the culture of uh, whites, uh, tend to be more institutional, benefits preferred, uh, are benefits referred to as white privilege. And this is what happens in the United States. White people f feel that they are privileged. And uh, with select uh, uh, political uh, happenings in the United States, uh, white privilege becomes either more or less uh, important. Um, there are MAGA Republicans think that they are that white privilege is something that they deserve and that they should that and they think Trump's going to give it back to them. Whites often do not recognize that they are privileged because it is the norm. Just like attractive people don't recognize that they are privileged. And I don't know if you've ever been around a really attractive person, but really attractive people get things that you don't get because you're not as attractive as they are. Uh, the assumption is that if you're attractive, uh, it, it's not only is, is it a positive thing, but everything around them. It's like the halo effect. Because they are attractive, everything, everything that they have to do with is perfect. Tall people don't recognize that they're privileged, tall, tall, especially tall males. Tall females, not so much. But tall males, geez, they become the leaders. They uh, are recognized as, as the most important person in the room. Um, and when we look at uh, uh, presidents, uh, so often the tall, the tall candidate is the one that's elected. Why? Because he's seen more as a, as a leader. Uh, athletes don't recognize that they're privileged, uh, mainly because they don't, you know, they're given things. And they just assume, or, you know, just like attractive people and tall people, they assume everybody gets this stuff. Do, uh, really? No, that's not the way it works. As a short, ugly guy, boy, I'll, I'll tell you what. Luckily, I was an athlete. Women and men are different. <clears throat> I know, that's a shock, isn't it? <clears throat> they respond differently to the same stimuli, and therefore they must be approached differently in therapy. Research shows that uh, the male and female brain are quite different. The male brain is larger. The female brain is smaller. The female br brain is more integrated because her co corpus callosum is larger. Uh, so they have different ways of seeing things. They have different forms of logic. Uh, so if you're dealing with a male and you're dealing with a female, and it, I, I'm, I'm sure that this is no secret that I'm telling you. Uh, you, you do not treat males and females the same. Sex is based on genitals. Men are born with penises, women are born with vaginas. But the difference in brain structure begins after about the sixth week. At that point, the male fetal brain is bathed in testosterone, and that changes everything. But sex isn't always the final word on gender. Gender is the social assignments of how males and females are supposed to act. And of course, this is becoming more obvious as uh, different, sec uh, different sexual orientations are being accepted by society. Once upon a time, uh, it was just like this. Girls are nurses and boys are doctors. Boys are policemen and girls are meter maids, you know, okay. That, that was, uh, you know, everything was an absolute. Men are soldiers and women are, are, are uh, nurses. Uh, it's kind of funny because my wife is a retired Air Force colonel. And when people find uh, find out that she was a, uh, in the Air Force and, and she served for 24 years, they think that she must have been a nurse. She couldn't possibly have been a pilot. She couldn't possibly have been anything but a nurse because only women are nurses, as weird as that sounds. And of course, our behavior, very frequently, we can assume that the stereotypes we have about gender are true, but the reality is, of course, not everybody follows the gender stereotypes. Oops. Gender stereotypes prescribe how a person should respond to life. Unfortunately, social construction of gender continues throughout our life, our lives. Gender bias comes through the use of unexamined stereotypes. The good counselor will ignore stereotypes and allow their client to express feelings freely. So if a female comes in 
one of the things that you need to do is not assume that just because she's a female, she's not a leader, she's not, uh, uh, you know, she's a nurse instead of a, a, a potentially a pilot. Um, you know, she can't be a fireman but it, because all firemen are six foot four and weigh uh, 275 pounds. No, 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 no. You, you know, you got to throw all that out the window. You've got to listen to her to find out who she is or who she wants to be. Uh, potentially, she doesn't want to be referred to as she. Now we are throwing out people's stereo or the uh, pronouns. Uh, so just because you're female doesn't mean that you want to be a she. Maybe she wants to become male. Maybe that's her sexual orientation. She wants to be a male. And you've got to listen to all this. Some people do not agree with, with the sex they are assigned by genetics. These individuals are referred to as transgender. If they have sex reassignment surgery, they become transsexual. So they, you could be transgender where you have the idea that you want to be the opposite sex and after you have the surgery that makes you transsexual and this is the guy and this is what he looked like after his transsexual surgery his reassignment surgery excuse me transgender and transsexualism has nothing to do with sexual orientation sexual orientation is the direction or directions of one's sexual affectionate or loving attention. Embedded in sexual orientation are societal beliefs, stereotypes, and views about sexual expression. Coming out uh, for homosexuals is complicated, but has been made easier by legalization of homosexual unions. Practitioners are not immune to heterosexism. And of course, the vast majority of people that you meet will, will not uh, be dealing with this problem. But because you deal with people's problems, actually you may see a higher percentage of individuals that are dealing with this that you need to deal with than, than are in the, uh, in the population. Uh, say it, it's, uh, if it may represent uh, a, a, three to five percent of the population and you may have to deal with this uh, 15 to 20 percent of the time. Why? Because you deal with problems and this is a problem that, that individuals may have uh, transitioning and, and uh, uh, understanding why people are treating them differently. Uh, socioeconomic status refers to the standards and measurements of economic wealth and structures. Socioeconomic status is especially efficacious in capitalist economies where will, wealth dictates your position in society. And if you don't believe me, then uh, look at what's going on with, uh, with all the billionaires in the United States. We seem to hear about Elon Musk every day. We seem to hear about Donald Trump every day. We seem to hear about Bill Gates from time to time. Who else did we just hear about? Oh, Mark Zuckerberg. I think he was going to have a boxing match with Elon Musk or something. Who cares? Who cares? Well, people care because they're billionaires. Uh, and a billion dollars is a million million. That seems like a lot of money. Socioeconomic status is based on several measurements, your income, your occupation, and your education. And I had this conversation with my colleague from Bangladesh because he didn't understand what his status was as a college professor, as a, an individual who, with a PhD. I told him it gave, gave him uh, elite status, it gave him a, a certain uh, ca cachet uh, that put him uh, in, in a uh, higher socioeconomic status, something he's not used to. So we'll see how he reacts when he gets to the United States. Socioeconomic status influences many aspects of your life. Uh, quality of health care, you, you can buy all the health care you want. Obesity is tied to socioeconomic status, uh, educational possibilities, neighborhoods that you can afford, and child care. You can move anywhere you want, you can do anything you want. Really kind of interesting. He wanted me to help him find a, an apartment in Indianapolis, um, but he didn't want to live in a bad neighborhood. Well, okay, <laughs> but, 
but he's not making that much money. So it was it was a bit tricky trying to get him into a, a good neighborhood. And I don't know if we did or not, uh, but, uh, well, we'll see what happened. This is kind of an interesting picture. This is Bill Gates, one, the richest man in the world. And this is Warren Buffett uh, from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, he's from Seattle, and he's from Omaha, Nebraska. And Warren Buffett, of course, is also one of the richest men in the world. I think he's third or fourth in the United States behind Gates, Buffett, and who's uh, Be uh, Jeff Bezos is the other guy. And, of course, child care, of course. It is important for practitioners to understand the invisible but powerful impact of socioeconomic status. The higher the socioeconomic status, the more likely a practitioner will assume success for their client. And, of course, with success often comes uh, too much leisure, and too much leisure off can often lead to frustration and uh, depression. For many clients, spiritual and religious beliefs and training are key to their existence. A wise practitioner will not question a client's spiritual or religious training. And this gets kind of tough because there are some um, counselors out there that uh, only went into counseling to counsel Mormons or to counsel evangelical Christians. Uh, I, uh, when I was working at uh, Ashford University, the head of our counseling department was a Lutheran minister. And, of course, uh, that was tough for him. It was, it was hard for him to deal with people that weren't religious because, you know, that's his life. He was a Lutheran minister. We had some very interesting conversations. But he was a nice guy. Religion involves communal behaviors. Spirituality can be understood as an individual's uh, relationship to God or any ultimate power. And these guys are Shia Muslims. Uh, one day a year, the day that their martyr, their, uh, uh, it's not Muhammad, it's Muhammad's cousin or something, uh, was trying to take over the Muslim religion. And he went out into the desert and, they, and he was assassinated. And so on the day that he was assassinated, they flagellate themselves. Uh, and, of course, they're hitting themselves with things that will make them bleed. So they, what they want to do is bleed like their martyr did. He was also beheaded, and that's why they have, that's why they put these hoods over their heads. To show that he, they are with him, they are part of, of this. This is the Shia religion, as compared to the Shiite religion, uh, which follows a different trajectory. And that's one of the reasons why the Shia and the Shiites uh, very often uh, are at, at odds with one another. And it goes all the way back to Muhammad, you know, 600, I don't know, it's more than that. It's uh, 1,400 years ago when, when the religion was trying to decide what, which direction to go after Muhammad died. As weird as that sounds. Anyway, that's why I put that picture in there. Uh, some religions are totalitarian in nature or don't ex accept uh, any other religious concept as legitimate but their own. Other religions are pluralist in nature and accept many practices as legitimate. And, of course, uh, <laughs> there's only one way to go to heaven, and that's by whatever you know that religion happens to be. As curious as that is, it always makes me laugh because... You know, you get two of these preachers together, and they, they both have absolutist ideas about how to go to heaven. And uh, so very often they get into nothing but arguments about how to go to heaven. A practitioner must be aware that their own spirituality or religion might taint their view of a client. So this can be, sometimes can be a problem. A practitioner must accept a client within the client's religious context. And that's kind of tough for some people because uh, they may have evangelical ideas, uh, they may have absolutist ideas, and it's really hard for them to talk to somebody who doesn't agree with them. As we age, we change, going from an infant to a toddler to a child to an adolescent. 
to a young adult and then declining as an adult until we are no longer functional and then we die. Life stage, stages are influenced by our biological development. Eric Erickson identified eight life stages that occur in everyone's life tied to a psychological crisis that must take place for the individual to develop normally uh, psychologically. And this is Eric Erickson. He was not born as Eric Erickson, as curious as that is. And I'm going to tell you the quick story of Eric Erickson. He was born uh, into a Jewish family. And his mother had had an affair with a Danish sea captain. So he looks, he was blonde-headed and blue-eyed. Jewish people are dark-haired and they have dark eyes. Uh, so he didn't look Jewish. He, was, he looked German. Uh, so he didn't fit in either society. And that was, that was Eric Erickson. But that wasn't even his name. He was born as one thing. And then his mother married his pediatrician, and his name was Holmberger. So his name was Eric Holmberger. And he lived with Eric Holmberger until he graduated from high school. And at that point, his mother told him, hey, look, Eric. Actually, this is before he graduated. He didn't actually graduate. So his mother said, look, Eric, uh, the Holmberger guy is not your, not your real dad. He's not your biological father. And... Erickson was so pissed, or he was so upset, that he decided he would go find his father. And that's why he didn't graduate from high school. So when he's 16, he becomes this wandering individual looking, going from, uh, from uh, uh, seaport to seaport, looking for his Danish sea captain father, who he doesn't have a clue what his name is. He just knows, he just knows he's a blonde-headed, blue-eyed Danish sea captain. And he wanders his way around to Europe, and he finally ends up in, in Italy. And in Italy, Italy uh, he starts learning about Montessori. He starts working in a Montessori school. And because he Montessori is one way of doing things, uh, and he gets to work with children, and he's such a young guy, uh, he learns a lot about kids. And then uh, he, his school is visited by Anna Freud, the daughter of Sigmund Freud, and she talks him into going to Vienna uh, because he speaks German. And, of course, uh, Austrian German is very similar to German German. Um, and uh, so he goes to Vienna and starts working with Anna. Anna works with children, and Sigmund works with adults. Uh, and eventually, of course, the Nazis take over, and Erickson decides that he has to leave. So he gets on a ship, and he comes over. To the United States. <clears throat> on the ship, uh, he keeps getting all these these uh, cables from because he's worked with Sigmund Freud and because he's worked with children and because he's written this book about the life stages. Uh, everybody wants him. Everybody wants him. And so Yale is is trying to get him to go there. Stanford's trying to get him to go uh, to stand to teach at Stanford. Uh, Harvard is, is uh, asking him if he wants to come over. And at this point, he's in a, he's in a crisis of his own uh, because he's, his, his name has been Holmberger, except he rejected that name when he was looking for his father, his biological father. But he never found him. So he decides, on the ship, he decides to be Eric's, Eric Erickson. Eric, uh, son of himself, is, is why he named himself. Eric Erickson, as weird as that sounds. Anyway, there he is. Okay, so we're going to go through the stages of life. And, and of course, because Erickson, uh, his life was just uh, tumultuous because he looked like a German, but he was actually Jewish, so he was rejected by everybody. Everything was a crisis for him. So he goes through the life stages uh, that he came up with uh, dealing with... Uh, the children of Montessori school, and then with Anna Freud. And this is what he came up with. So the first life stage, the first crisis that you uh, take, uh, that you deal with, uh, where you're looking for, you're hoping that uh, the things will be good, is um, uh, trust versus mistrust. Can you trust your parents to be there when, they, when you need them, when your diaper's wet, when you're hungry? Will they feed you? Will they change your diaper? 
should you trust them to be there if you call them? And of course, you call them by crying. So for the first two years of your life, you're going through the crisis of trust versus mistrust. And it's, of course, hope is, is, is the uh, uh, direction that you're, that you're going because you, you hope that, uh, that you'll be taken care of. Where will the caregiver be there when the infant needs food, sucre, or the change of clothing? The second life stage happens with potty training, and that happens somewhere between uh, 18 months and, uh, and uh, four, four years, sometime in the second and third year. Uh, and so the crisis is uh, autonomy versus shame and doubt. Will I be autonomous? Will I be able to handle things on my own? Will I wet myself? Uh, will I you know, be able to understand that I need to deposit my waste uh, in a proper receptacle when it's time uh, to, uh, to evacuate myself? So that's the second stage, trust for, or autonomy versus shame and doubt. The third stage, well, what do we look at? Oh, will. I, I, you have to have the will to, uh, to be able to uh, control yourself. So the third stage is purpose. What in the world am I going to do with my life? The third crisis has to do with initiative. Do I have the initiative to, to become someone all by myself? Or will I feel guilty about not having that capability? And this runs all the way up to, to the uh, preschool times. Uh, up to age five. Will my parents allow me to develop the interests of my own? Will I develop any interests of my own? Have they allowed me to discover the world? Do I recognize things on my own? Or do, do I have to ask my mother if I can think about this? And of course, it's initiative versus guilt. The fourth stage, uh, competence, has to do with uh, starting school. Uh, you uh, either work hard and try to, to uh, do what the teacher tells you to do, or you will feel inferior. That's the social crisis you're going through. Will I achieve the, uh, the same uh, level of uh, intellectuality that my peers have, or will I feel inferior to everyone? And if you think about uh, when you were in elementary school, uh, you were always saying, well, I'm the best math guy. But, uh, but uh, Sally talks better than I do, and uh, John is better at writing than I am. And uh, Jacob is a much better reader than I am. So we're always comparing ourselves with everybody else. But that's okay, because we're all doing well enough that the teacher is accepting us. But there's that... You know, Charlie, old Charlie, he's uh, just sits in the back of the room and uh, uh, eats crayons or eats paste. I remember we had Gail Bartle was a paste eater. So you couldn't let him anywhere close to your paste or he would eat it. <laughs> the fifth life stage, fidelity, encompasses adolescence and all the problems fought from uh, that transition. The crisis that Erickson identified at this point of, in life was ad identity versus rural confusion. Who will I be as an adult? And of course, this is when we decide in the direction that we're going to take to when we become an adult. Uh, maybe we just want to date somebody. Maybe we just want to uh, be a mother. You know, Maybe we don't want to go in any special direction. Maybe we don't want to have a job. And this is what was going on before in the 1950s. Uh, so if you read my, uh, my oldest sister's yearbook, uh, she graduated uh, from high school in 1962, I think. She graduated, she was born in 44, so she graduated in 62 or 61. Well, anyway, when you read her yearbook, all the girls in the school wanted to be a mother and a, and a homemaker. That's what everybody wanted to do. That was their, their new identity. My sister, of course, wanted to be a lawyer. There were two people that didn't want to just be a mother and a, and a uh, homemaker. I'm not saying that that's not something that's wonderful, but what I'm saying is nobody wanted a career except my sister and another, another young lady. 
Uh, the sixth life stage, love, occurs as a, a, as a young adult. Uh, the crisis that Erickson identified at this point in life was intimacy versus isolation. And you don't have to get married. You can stay by yourself. Uh, you don't have to have a family. Uh, you can live alone. Will I pair bond and have children, or will I remain alone? And with all these guys on their phones, it looks like they're all choosing to be alone. Uh, the seventh life stage, care, involves getting older and runs through the heart of the individual's working years or uh, to retirement. The crisis involved is generativity versus stagnation. Will I teach somebody to, do, uh, to uh, have the knowledge that I have? Will I mentor someone, somebody? Will I help the future? Will I do something for the future? The last, last life stage is wisdom. It deals with the individual's declining years, and it ends with death. The crisis the individual faces at, the sta at this stage of life involves a life well-lived or a life wasted, and the crisis is integrity versus despair. So if you've been a workaholic all your life, you didn't have a family, uh, and uh, you thought that uh, the best thing that I can do is to rip everybody off, uh, you get close to death, you're, you're, you've got this big pile of money that you're sitting on, and you look back on your life and you go, oh man, I ripped everybody off. What a jerk I was. And so you look back on your life with despair. Most of us, of course, don't do that. We have families. Uh, we uh, try not to hurt people, uh, hopefully. And so we look back and we say, we look back with integrity. Different rates of physical development and social pressures influence life stage decisions. Some people may go through the life stages quickly because they were forced to support their family at an early age. Others may delay getting into adulthood because life situations have not forced them through identity versus identity confusion. And of course, this happened uh, to, uh, to us uh, in my era because of the Vietnam War. Um, when I went to college, it was either that or the Army. And if I hadn't gone to college and gotten a 2S deferment, I probably would have ended up in the Army sooner than I did. Uh, I was able to graduate uh, with a bachelor's degree in 1971. Um, and of course, most of the characters in Seth Rogen's movies are like adolescents that never grow up. Uh, it's kind of the same way people are, you know, they want to stay drunk all their life. Well, geez, you want to stay a kid all your life? Okay. Oddly, during adolescence, everyone wants to fit in, but adulthood means establishing your own identity. And these movies where all these guys are all running around with uh, their high school buddies, uh, they haven't grown up. They haven't become adults. They don't have their own identity. Their identity is their group. Wait a minute, that's not right. Anyway, practitioners help clients deal with challenges of, of uh, life stages. Not everyone passes through or is allowed to pass through the life stages at the same rate. Some people are assisted through, through the life stages. Yes, I want men to fight over me. Family influences our worldview. What, what we are told as children will temper the way that we deal with people outside the family all of our lives. Even the concept of family may be skewed by those who we grow up with. Understanding how we have been affected by our own family helps us recognize these experiences as personal and not assume that the same meanings and experiences are true for others. One person may have no support from their parents. Another individual might recognize cousins or anyone similar as brothers and sisters. There are a number of groups of people who are referred to as family amongst the uh, traditional Diné, and that's the spelling that uh, from the book, by the way. Clans dictate uh, family and extended relationships. There are individuals that do not put the accent mark on there, and uh, you'll see that in the, in the textbook, in the first chapter. Maybe I should change that. Well, not right now. Yeah, I can almost change it right now. There you go. Sorry. 
I don't know why I didn't catch that earlier. Developmental stages for families are influenced by culture, religious and spiritual beliefs, socioeconomic status, etc. As families develop in time, changes in any of these uh, statuses can cause changes in family dynamics. Family has changed in recent decades. Divorce was once a social stigma, but now many people have multiple marriages and thus multiple families. Blended families have become the norm. Uh, when I was going to school, there was only one person in my school that, ha that came from a divorced family, and that was my best friend. Denny, Denny Costerison was his name. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Steve Costerison. It was Denny's cousin. He, that was the only divorced person in the whole school. But now, of course, and then they, le they liberalized the divorce laws. So in the 1960s, most of the states a lot started allowing divorce. Before that, you couldn't get a divorce. It was almost impossible to get a divorce. And then, of course, this is a television show from the 70s showing, yeah, divorce is okay. I think somebody was divorced. Somebody's husband died. The other, the, uh, I think Carol's husband died and his wife divorced him. Or maybe it was the other way. Her husband divorced her, and, and his wife died. I don't remember. Anyway, the, they, it was a blended family. So all the dark-haired people were belonged to him, and all the blondes belonged to her. So it was a, it was a bl blended family. Disabilities are a fact of life. With every ability we tout, there are those, including us, who may lack that ability. I can remember lots of things I have uh, that I have a hard time remembering, but I have a hard time remembering lyrics to songs. I don't know why I have this, this block for song lyrics. And my daughter makes fun of me to no end because she can hear a song one time and she knows all the, the words. And I can listen to a song over and over again and I keep making the same stupid mistakes. So I have this middle block about, uh, about lyrics. That's my disability. Disabilities come in all shapes and sizes. Some make life a struggle, while others, like my lyrics phobia, have very little impact at all, except my daughter makes fun of me and thinks I'm the biggest idiot in the world. It is estimated that 20% of the people in the United States will experience a serious disability in their lifetime. That's a lot. Developmental disabilities are severe and chronic. They are due to a mental or physical impairment. They manifest themselves before the age of 22. They're likely to continue indefinitely. They result in substantial functional limitations. They represent services and a support for survival. In the past, many people with disabilities were isolated from the mainstream community. However, through legislation, people with disabilities are now afforded the opportunity to live lives as close to that of a non-disabled person as possible. There are legal protections for those with disabilities. Americans with Disabilities Act, Amer uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Her uh, Fair Housing Act, Rehabilitation Act, Affordable Health Care, uh, Health Choices Act. Language is, an imp is important when dealing with people with a disability. Words used in the past may have taken on the stronger and stronger stigmas. Therefore, being politically correct when dealing with disabilities makes the stigma less intrusive. And of course, these are the old words, these are the incorrect words, and these are the new words that are more politically correct. It is important for practitioners to take care of themselves. They must be aware of possible stressors in their private life that can impact their lives. They must maintain a sense of perspective. They are living vicariously. Are they living vicariously through their clients? And this should be a question mark, but I'm not going to change it right now. Healthcare workers always have this problem, and counselors are healthcare workers. The practitioner is the instrument of therapy, and unless they are cared for and in tune, they will not be able to do their job. Focusing on others and ignoring your own uh, needs can lead to burnout, and that's what it looks like when you burn out. 
your brain fries and smoke starts pouring out of your ears. Just kidding, of course. Burnout is increasing uh, discouragement and emotional and physical exhaustion. Burnout is not uncommon among practitioners. Building a healthy lifestyle is important and must be started immediately. Don't wait until you graduate to get into the groove of a healthy lifestyle. The sooner you start, the more routine it will become. So start now. When a practitioner is working with a client, they will sometimes begin experiencing the emotional and physical pain of their clients. This is known as secondary traumatic stress. Uh, it starts out as empathy, but eventually it moves, it becomes debilitating, and then it becomes secondary traumatic stress. It is important to work on developing character strengths, such as creativity, love of learning, humility, and other qualities you need to, to create yourself and develop muscles like that and to shave your head bald. And that's the end of the, the chapter. So there you go. Next week, uh, we'll talk about two different, two different chapters. So I like this picture. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys next week.